um, thank you very much, um, Kristen and Sandy, um, for organizing this wonderful conference. And I hope there'll be um, many more in, in, in next years. Um, so today um, I'll be talking about some evolutionary dynamics um, of cancer cells. And I'm going to be talking kind of about two general topics, but they're, they're, they're related. Um, one, one is um, cellular evolution in colorectal cancer and how this relates to um, um, aspirin mediated protection and chemo prevention. And then I'm going to um, go a bit more deeper into models of homeostasis, feedback response. How do you actually, how should you maybe model um, tissue dynamics um, in a um, more realistic uh, way? Um, so we'll start, get going with the, with the first part. Um, chemo prevention um, by aspirin in colorectal cancer. And so there's a lot of good data out there um, that show that if people take aspirin in the long term, um, the incidence of colorectal cancer is significantly lower. And, and, and there are a variety of data out there. Um, one study with Lynch syndrome, which is a um, genetic predisposition to colorectal cancer. Uh, um, very clear data, as you can see on the graphs on, on, on the top there. Um, and in general, also with a sporadic colorectal cancer, um, there's a good amount of protection and there's good data doc to document this. In fact, it's it, in a variety of cancers, you see that aspirin has um, protective effects and reduces the incidence of cancer. And the data are, are, are really are, are really quite um, convincing to the extent that I started taking aspirin when I started working on this. Um, so this is the data. This is um, what we start off from. Um, so what are the mechanisms underlying this aspirin mediated protection? It's, it's not entirely clear. There's a lot of uh, molecular work going on, um, molecular mechanisms, um, Cox dependent, Cox independent pathways by which um, protection can be mediated. Aspirin obviously has anti-inflammatory effects and inflammation is a driver of cancer. So it's all got to do with that. Um, when we thought about this, uh, we got together with a couple of um, gastroenterologists. This is um, Rick Boland at UCSD and RJ Cole at, at, at City of Hope. And we, we wondered whether, if you think about it in evolutionary, in evolutionary terms, we could get some, some insights. Rather than just thinking of the molecular biology of the cell, um, can evolution um, tell us something? Does aspirin have an effect on the evolution um, of the cells? And so we started working on this. Yifan Wang was a postdoc who was working on, on this together um, with Natalia. And we, so we got a grant for this and we set out to, uh, to, to work on this stuff. So we started out quite simple in, in, in a very basic setting. Do some experiments, do some in vitro experiments um, in just in a dish, cells in a dish. There were different colorectal cancer cell lines that were used and they have different characteristics. Some are um, uh, microsatellite stable, some are unstable, they have different mutational profiles. But essentially, um, they were put on, in the dish. Aspirin was given to them, and then the dynamics of the cell growth um, was followed over time. So a very simple experiment, not the most realistic setting, but you gotta, gotta start somewhere. So this is the kind of data that you get out of um, these experiments. These are just um, growth curves, the number of percent of viable cells over time. And you can see that, um, well, this was done with various doses of aspirin without aspirin and increasing doses. And, and these doses in vitro were kind of selected to be um, representative of what you would give physiologically um, to, to, to patients. Um, what we observed was that growth was slowed down. This is just the overgrowth and was slowed down in a dose dependent manner. And that was true for all the cell lines um, considered. So you can see that very, very clearly that the stronger the aspirin dose, the slower these populations grew. And so we wanted to do some basic quantification with that. Can we kind of quantify the division rates, um, the death rates, dead cells were, were stained. So we could do that. And so we just fit a very basic model to it. It's the most basic thing that, that you can, can have. It's exponential growth is what happens in the, in the dish. Um, the cells re replicate and they die. And when they die, they hang around for a while and then disappear. Before we get to the parameters, just some, some more basic data stuff. We tried to figure out, is there any correlation with any status of, of what types of cells that cell lines that we used? So we used MMR deficient, proficient cells, um, KRAS mutant Y type. There was no, no um, big difference there, but there was a difference with the PIK3CA um, mutational status um, that um, the PIKA mutants, um, they responded better to aspirin than 
than, than the wild types. Um, it's a mutation associated with cancer. What it really is, I think, is shown in the bottom graph there, um, where on the x-axis we plot the, the growth rate of the cells in the in the absence of aspirin, and the y-axis shows the reduction, the extent of reduction mediated by by aspirin. And the faster the cells grow, the the, the more strongly the, the cell cell growth is inhibited. So we think it's it's, it's to do with the with, with the growth rate. So that's data. Then we did the basic um, parameter estimates, and and what we find is quite a clear picture. So we know that the growth rate of the cells, which is the exponential growth rate, slows down in the dose-dependent manner with aspirin. That's the first graph. Then on the right is the division rate that it tees out. The higher the aspirin dose, the slower these cells um, divide. And then panel C is um, the more aspirin you give, the, the faster the cells die. So aspirin has quite a profound effect on the kinetics of cell growth, reducing the rate of cell proliferation and increasing the rate of cell death. And so that's um, a pretty easy and pretty straightforward result, but I think it has important, um, important consequences when we think about protection mediated by aspirin. So we use these numbers and try to kind of do some very basic back of the envelope calculations, essentially assume that you, you, you have um, a, a cell is a growing colony. Um, so let, let's say a, a new tr a transformed cell was generated. Um, in, in the tissue, if this is the same kinetics, then, then what is the chances that this cell will actually grow successfully um, rather than um, go extinct? So we look at the probability to establish um, clonal expansion, and that's uh, assuming basic birth death processes, mass action, nothing, nothing special. Um, but you see that um, with higher aspirin dose, you reduce the chances that the cell population will grow by quite a bit, by up to 30%. So this gives us a hint, maybe, maybe these basic kinetic changes that you observe in the, in, in the, in the presence of aspirin can actually explain quite a bit of the um, uh, protective effect observed in epidemiological um, data. Um, then we took it a little bit further. Let's now assume that um, a cell colony is established, right? Where well, there's a probability it's reduced, but if, if you take aspirin, uh, a cell colony, a mutant cell colony, a transformed cell colony can still start to grow and give rise to a tumor. So what happens when a tumor breaks through and grows in the presence of aspirin? So again, back of the envelope kind of calculation, simple um, from, derived from simple birth death processes. So we, we, we're plotting what is the, um, the, the change in the number of average number of mutants in the colony as it goes to a certain threshold size, um, such as 10 to the 10 cells or, or whatever we use there. Um, we looked at um, neutral mutants, advantageous, disadvantageous mutants, 2% in this case is the fitness difference. And what you see is that um, the higher the aspirin dose, the more mutants you're going to have when you hit a certain size. And the reason is simply these kinetics that I showed to you just a minute ago. If cells divide less and die more, that turnover is higher. If the turnover of the cells is higher, you need more divisions to get to a threshold size, threshold colony size, and so you accumulate more mutants. And so what, what this tells us is that aspirin reduces the chance that the colony forms, which can contribute to the protective effect. But if somebody does get a, a growing tumor in the presence of aspirin, then they may actually have a higher mutational load um, when the tumor becomes detectable. Similar thing here is we can also ask what is rather than looking at the average number of mutants, what is the probability that the mutant is present at size n? You can look at the one hit mutant, two hit mutant, three hit mutants. That probably gets higher with increasing aspirin dose, telling the same story essentially. Um, so um, with this, um, there, we did a very simple study um, in vitro basic kinetics, but what we find is that higher aspirin results in lower division, more death rate that results. Um, in a reduced um, probability to form a colony, but if a tumor does develop, it can actually be perhaps be a more virulent tumor because it has a higher mutational um, load. And so if this is true, then if, if people are put on aspirin and they, they, they're in a cohort, then you should be monitoring them closely what, what, what actually, whether something grows or not, and if, if something is detected, act early. So that was the first part of, of, of the study. Um, then we wanted to know if we do this in vivo, is, are there going to be any differences or not? So we went and 
did experiments, not me, but my collaborators did experiments um, in xenografts and mice, used the cell lines to grow them on the back of the mouse and subjected them um, to aspirin. Again, doses corresponding to those that we consider physiologically relevant, given the number of pills that people are taking in, 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 in those cohorts that do take um, aspirin. And we basically found very similar results. You can see here that there's, again, in for different cell lines, a dose-dependent reduction in the growth rate of the cell populations. Again, there's not much of a difference with whether it's um, a microsatellite stable or unstable, but with the PIK3, PIK3CA mutational status, there is a significant difference, which we again think is because of the different division rates of these, of these cells. So again, we tried to measure parameters. Now we're dealing with a 3D blob, um, so we can't really use a simple ODE. So you, kind of take a phenomenological ODE that describes this sort of spatial expansion of, of, of a blob, and we can fit that to the data, and that fits pretty well, describes them pretty well. And, and, and so very similar, again, dead cells were stained, um, and, and pretty similar to, last, to, to, to the last part, we can calculate the parameters of this model, and we again find a similar um, picture. So, as the aspirin doses increase, the death rate of the cells increases and the division rate of the cell decreases in a very clear dose dependent manner. So all the results that we saw in vitro, they carried over in, in vivo, uh, which, is, which is nice. And so now we have um, in vivo changes. We have an idea of if you give a given dose, how, by how much does it reduce the division rate and death rate in vivo setting. Then again, we um, took these numbers and try to run simulations. So we ran an agent-based model and, and, and asked with a given aspirin doses and the kinetic changes that you observe um, with aspirin, um, what is the chance that a colony gets established? Um, is this protective effect equal, equally strong? And we wanted to go beyond these cell lines that we had in, 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 in the mice and, and the mouse data we used to say, okay, a given aspirin dose gives us a certain amount of change in the death rate and the division rate. So let's assume we have different cells with different characteristics that turn over at different rates. We call them virtual cell lines. Then we apply aspirin by, give, by, by changing the kinetics by the experimentally observed values. And then we ask, what is the chance to um, um, form a colony um, there? So this is on the x-axis, you see the um, turnover, basically, death rate divided by division rate, low turnover on the left, high turnover on the right. Um, so in the absence of aspirin, it's a black line. Um, you do see a re reduction in colony formation as expected if, if, if you increase the turnover, but it's massively stronger if you get the strongest aspirin dose that, 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 that we used, which is the red line on, on this graph there. Um, and you can see that the effect of aspirin becomes stronger for higher turnover tumors. So for low, low turnover tumors, um, you wouldn't expect much of a protective effect to be seen, but the higher the turnover rate of the tumor cell population, um, the stronger um, the aspirin effect gets. And, and um, that's based on, on, on these data. Question is, what is turnover? Because you've got stem cells and differentiated cells, and if you think about what's happening in human. But in, in, in general, if, if, if things divide more and die more, then you will expect aspirin to, to make a, um, a bigger difference. So we've got this, we had these experiments in vitro and in vivo, and we did some basic calculations showing that um, colony formation is reduced. It's sort of basic, basic exploration. And that indicated to us that aspirin can actually have a, 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 a perhaps have a strong protective effect just by through these kinetic measures. So we, we wanted to know, can we apply this to humans somehow? Can, can we, if we make some assumptions, and, and there are a lot of assumptions that are going to go in here, but if, if we assume that in humans, aspirin makes the same difference quant quantitatively to the death rate and the division rate of cells, um, can we figure out whether we can account for the reduced incidence curves of colorectal cancer in epidemiological um, data? And so we constructed, uh, worked with the, with the basic model of colorectal cancer um, initiation in, in humans and try to uh, fit that to epidemiological data. And we concentrated on not really colorectal cancer, but um, the sort of late advanced adenoma stage, um, because that's quite, quite, quite well defined. The, um, the mutational events, well, it's, there are uncertainties there, but, but there, there's 
a decent under understanding of it. And there are good, good data out there for advanced adenoma and the, the good data out there that show how aspirin protects against advanced adenoma. So this is just the data that we used from a specific paper in 2014. The red um, dots are, are um, that, that's separated by sexes, so the females and males, red and, red and blue, or the other way around, I forget, and, and the, uh, the, the, the black is an average of, over those, and, and, and since we were starting out on this, we didn't look at these differences, we just took the averages and, 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 and used, used that. And so the model um, is based on a previously published model um, that Ivana published, and we modified that a little bit for, for our purposes, and then um, use that. So, so these are the evolutionary paths that, that we have. We have um, the, the path towards colorectal cancer. We, we have the APC tumor suppressor gene um, that needs to get active, inactivated. And you also have KRAS, that is an oncogene that needs to get activated. Once you have both of these processes, which we call type six in this model, um, you, have a, you, you, you have what we think is an advanced adenoma. And that puts, it's already a lot of assumptions in there. Um, there can be pathways towards an advanced adenoma that are independent or they're different from, from these things. But I think our model holds true if the, the development of an advanced adenoma requires the loss of a tumor suppressor gene and the activation of an oncogene. Um, so whatever the identities of these are, um, if this is the case, then this is um, true. And so colon is organized into, into crypts. These are the units it's where the stem cells sit. And, and so we're looking at the crypt dynamics. We're looking at intra-crypt dynamics. So within a crypt, a cell can transition from... I am online. I have coffee too, It'll make me more, even more online. So, so um, we have the crypts within the crypts. We start out with the APC++ and the, K, um, and the K, K, KRAS unmutated um, type. And then, and then we go through the mutational processes and within the crypt, we can calculate um, when the mutation gets generated, what is the chance to have a conversion that everybody, that the mutants take over, the populations are small. So if, if a mutant does come in, there's a good chance that the mutants take over. And when you get an, an advantageous type, such as an APC minus um, minus cell, this is these types with, with the circles, you get expansion and, and this happens by crypt fission. So the crypts divide. And, and, and they expand that way. And, and so we describe this um, with, with equations and, and then try to use that to predict age incidence and see whether you can fit the age incidence and then apply aspirin to that. That's a basic um, outline. So these are the equations. We're gonna go much, much into that. Again, they're very similar to, to, to Ivana's model. And we, we put a um, competition for crypt um, division in there because it suited our, our purposes better, fit the data better. Um, a lot of data, a lot of parameter estimates are available. And, and, and we use them, some of them are in, in, in this table here, and the rest, which we didn't have, we fitted um, by, by or estimated by fitting the model to the age incidence data. So this is what we did, that up there's the model, then they, these are the data that we fitted, the black, the black line, and then the um, bottom left shows you the, the curve where we fitted the data. The black dots are the data, the yellow um, lines are various fits. That fit the data. And you can see that many different parameter estimates actually fit these data quite well. So you can't uniquely determine what is the best fit of the model um, to these data. There's a whole range of parameters that, that, that fit them. So there's an identifiability problem there. But um, it doesn't matter so much because we can, we can look at a range of different parameters and see if you now introduce aspirin, um, what is it going to do? And I mean, long story short, for all the different best fitting parameter combination for many, the, the effect of aspirin gives rise to very consistent results. So it doesn't really matter what these parameters are, the effect of aspirin seems to be uh, consistent. So we don't have to worry too much um, about that. So, so the idea was we have this fit to the, to the natural incidence of, of, of these late adenomas. And then we assume, lots of assumptions are being made, but we assume that whatever we saw in, in, in the mice, the extent of reduction um, of, of division and death rates, they will carry over um, to humans. And then um, we will ask by how much does that reduce the, the age incidence, the incidence curve of late adenomas, and is that predicted reduction then consistent with what we see epidemiologically? And if so, we can say maybe these 
um, differences that we observe in our experiments, they can account for the differences in uh, for the protective effect observed epidemiologically. Um, and so, and there are a number of assumptions that go in there. Obviously, what happens in the human colon is a lot more complicated than what happens on the back of a mouse. Uh, for one, there, there, there's detailed tissue hierarchy with stem cells, more differentiated cells, terminally differentiated cells. Um, there's crypt fission going on. So we, we, we can assume that um, stem cells are affected by aspirin. And, and there's some data out there that, that, that show that they are indeed significantly affected by aspirin. Um, we know that the cell division and death rates are affected by aspirin and um, crypt fission is driven essentially by the cell birth death processes, I think, so that can be proportional as well. So we make these assumptions and, 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 see, and see where we get, keeping in mind that we make a lot of assumptions. Um, so that's, that, that's the model. Um, so you, as I said, you can assume that these intracrypt dynamics are affected by aspirin. We can also assume that the crypt fission rates are uh, affected by aspirin. And in fact, we will do um, both. And this is up there is the protocol that we use in the simulations and in, in the calculations. Um, you start treatment at some point with aspirin after birth and, and you treat for a certain duration, which we can vary, then we allow some follow-up time and then we assess the predicted relative risk of, 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 of cancer development or adenoma development. And so we start off by basic plot, assuming that aspirin affects both the intracrypt and intercrypt um, dynamics. And we see that we get a clear reduction um, in the instance. So the black line is the epidemiologically observed um, age, age incidence curve for the, for the late adenomas. And the yellow line is the one that is predicted when we have aspirin intervention. And the green bars, you can't see them very well um, on the screen, but these are the times when um, aspirin treatment is applied and, and indicates also the duration. And as you can see, if you start treating too late, at, when people are too old, then the effect dwindles and kind of goes away. So this shows this in more detail. Um, we can vary the dose according to the different doses that we used, and we see a dose-dependent effect. The stronger the dose, the lower the relative risk of um, adenoma um, that we predict. And you can see it kind of ranges in the, the, the effect protective effect ranges sort of between whatever, 10 and 50%, depending on the exact um, assumptions that you make. And there's a study out there um, by Andrew Chan, who looked at the um, aspirin protection in, in, these, in, in, in late adenoma. And you can see the, the relative risk are, are down there. Um, they're well within the ranges that we predict with the model. So we think in general, this indicates that maybe these kinetic changes, these simple kinetic changes that we observe can actually account for quite a bit of the protective effect seen um, in, by, by aspirin. I'm not saying that this is the whole story and we can explain everything, but I think it, 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 the simple evolutionary dynamics may actually be an important component. So we can then mess around and, and vary um, a number of things. You can vary the, the amount of um, treatment years. So the, the shorter you treat, the less the effect, the longer you treat, the, the, the bigger the effect. Um, we can also ask what is the, um, what happens if you um, change your assumptions about what cell population aspirins, aspirin effect. So we have all these different types in the mutational pathway to colorectal cancer. Um, you can assume that only that final type six is affected, that the expansion of that population is, is affected by aspirin, nothing else is affected, or you can assume that, that all of the sort of mutant clones are, are affected, uh, their division rates are reduced and the death rates are increased. And so if you only assume type six is affected, the final type, then you have a, a reduced effect, which you can see on the graph on the left there. Um, if all of the mutant cell clones are affected, then you have a, a, a better effect. An interesting thing is on, on the right, we're looking at the risk reduction, making two different assumptions. Um, we, we can either assume that um, crypt fission is not affected by aspirin or crypt fission is affected by aspirin. So if you assume that the crypt fission process is not affected by aspirin, you lose the protective effect that is predicted by the model. So this tells us that aspirin actually needs to reduce the, the, the rate of crypt expansion um, in order for this protective effect to work based on these kinetics. Again, assuming that the cellular processes determine um, crypt dynamics. So from, from this part of the work, we, 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 we can 
conclude that while well, we find interesting results in, 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 in the animals, in vitro and in the animals, indicating that basic evolutionary dynamics changes to the basic kinetics can actually um, account for, for a good amount of protection observed in the patient cohorts. And, and this is when we apply that to the epidemiological data and, and um, make, make those predictions, they are very much in line with what is observed epidemiologically. So this is encouraging. Um, maybe evolutionary processes are, are key to um, uh, uh, explaining the protective effect, among other things, of course. Um, so then I want to go back to the, to the data, to the um, animal data and also the in vitro data and, and, and point out one thing and, and then talk about some evolutionary theory that, that, that we developed that I think is quite, quite interesting. So the division rate, the expansion rate of the cells is reduced when aspirin is given. Um, one thing we observed is that as aspirin dose is increased, um, the cells spend more time in G0, in arrest. So, so they're, they're, they're arrested more than arrested in the, in, the, in the cell cycle. So given that that happens, you can then ask, um, what if cells evolve to escape arrest and then they wouldn't, be, um, they wouldn't be susceptible to aspirin treatment anymore? So let's say you have a population, they, they all arrest when in, in, in the presence of aspirin and then, and then a mutant evolves that skips that arrest and essentially replicates faster. Can that now grow? In, grow independent of, of, of this inhibition and can then protection break down. So it's a basic evolutionary question. And, 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 and so we started to develop evolutionary theory and this goes a bit more abstract now. Um, so we made it into extreme case. We have an arresting population, um, which you can call the wild type. And then you have a non-arresting population, which if you want, you can call, call the mutant. And we considered a basic agent-based uh, model where we, we, we followed these over time. So the the arresting population has the stage zero, which is the arrested stage, and then they exit with a certain probability, and then they go into the stage one, and stage one then goes to stage two, which is the dividing stage, and then the offspring enters stage zero, and, and they remain arrested for a certain period of time. So the non-arresting population that skips stage zero altogether, they go straight from division to stage one, and so the cycle, cell cycle, is essentially faster. And we compete them against each other. That's what we want to do, and then see who is advantageous and what, and what happens. So first of all, if you grow them in isolation, you can very clearly see that the non-arresting population grows significantly faster than the arresting population. And that is not very surprising. Um, non-arresting population, they go through the cell cycle faster, so they, 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 they grow, grow quicker. And so if you have these things, you immediately think if you put these cells into competition with each other, obviously the faster replicating cell is the fitter cell, is the more advantageous cell, and will win out. So we expect the non-arresting population to win. But if you do this with, with, with ODEs, um, you see that they're actually neutral with respect to each other. So the non-arresting population does not have uh, an advantage. And, and the reason for this, I think, is that per cell, the number of offspring that you produce is the same, whether you go through the cell cycle quickly or whether you go through the cell cycle slowly. So if you um, run them in competition with each other in the ODEs, then um, they're, they're neutral and none has an advantage over the other. It gets more interesting than that. Rather than looking at the average dynamics, we look at the fixation probability of, of, of the cell. So we assume that the population is at equilibrium, that you're um, uh, arresting, you have the arresting population at equilibrium, we introduce one cell that is non-arresting, and we ask, what is the fixation probability of that non-arresting cell? And we determine that computationally in the agent-based model. So um, this is um, the, the graph. So we have what we expect if, they are if the mutant is neutral, because the ODEs tell us they, they're neutral. So this is what this blue bar there tells us um, what we expect when it's neutral. And the x-axis shows the probability to, to exit the arrest. And so, if that gets reduced, then you have more and more um, of, of an arrest of, of the resident population, the, the arresting population. And then you put the non-arresting in and, and, and see what happens. And what happens is that the fixation probability of the arresting mutant is actually lower than what you expect from neutral. So these faster growing non-arresting cells are actually disadvantageous if you, can, if you consider that um, 
measure, which is interesting because it means that somehow these cells might have a hard time to evolve. So, so why does that happen? Uh, this is something we're still working on. We don't quite understand it yet, but I'll give you what I, what I think anyways. Um, these dynamics are very similar to if you compete high turnover versus low turnover population. So you can, you can assume that a cell that goes into arrest is a low turnover population because they divide slower, die slower, and the non-arresting population is high, high turnover. And so if you have a basic birth-death process, you have um, division with the rate R, death with the rate D, that's a low turnover cell, then you multiply both rates by the fact, same factor alpha, you increase the turnover. If you formulate that in terms of ODEs, then you um, see neutral dynamics. If you look at the fixation probability of the fast turnover mutant, you see that it's actually disadvantageous. And, and so why is it disadvantageous? You can think about it a little bit as, as a constant population Moran process, and, and, and let's say you have 50% white, 50% mutant, blue and red, and, and in, in that process, you choose a cell to die, and then you replace it with a um, fitness, depending on the fitness of, of the cells. And in principle, the increased death rate should be cancelled out by the increased division rates, because they should exactly cancel each other out. But the mutants, they die faster, so you choose the mutant, um, you're more likely to choose the mutant to die, so you get rid of it, you can see that with the X there, and then you got to replace the mutant, but you now have fewer mutants um, then you have wild types and you're more likely to replace it with, with, with a wild type. So it's a subtle thing and we think that that may be um, accounting for that effect. But, but we're still working on that. We're still trying to think work, work that out. There's, a very, there's some very interesting problems, evolutionary problems associated with that. So just to um, finish that part um, up, um, it looks like a mutant that skips cell cycle arrest is disadvantageous. So, so a mutant in an aspirin-treated patient that, that um, skips arrest essentially and replicates faster may be unlikely to evolve. But one way in which we can make it evolve is to knock the population down periodically by disturbances because then you're not at equilibrium at competition, but then you have sort of an, a, a more of a growth phase, exponential growth phase, temporary, and that allows the... Um, non-arresting population to outrun the, the arresting one. Whether that's an important scenario or not, I don't know. We're just looking for scenarios. When can you actually select for, for, for such a mutant? OK, so that finishes up the first um, part of the talk. And, and so all of this consider tissue dynamics in a rather superficial way, right? You have the colonic crypts, and we have cell populations that, that, that evolve. but what happens in the tissue is a lot more complicated than, than this. So we have a very long standing interest in trying to figure out how do we model tissue dynamics, homeostasis, and evolution away from homeostasis during the development of cancer. So we look at models that explicitly take into account um, tissue hierarchy, stem cells, transit amplifying cells, differentiated cells. Um, so stem cells can self renew, they can differentiate. And, and, and there are then various controls that, um, that regulate these cell populations. And lineage control, lineage feedbacks are one thing that have been suggested in the literature to play an important role in homeostasis, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. And that this was done um, in, so by one of the grad students, um, Peter Uhl, um, who is in the joint grad program between SDSU and UCI, Ignacio has been working for us for a long time, and, and Keith, Keith Chan um, uh, is a collaborator on, on bladder cancer. I'm going to show some data um, from him. Natalia was also obviously involved. And so um, what, what are these kind of models? I mean, in, on, on, on some level, you can assume that how do stem cells function? You can have asymmetric cell division, a stem cell device to give rise to one stem cell and, and one differentiated cell. But in mammalian um, tissues, it is data indicate that it's more likely that it's, it's a, a stochastic um, process that happens. So stem cells can, with a certain probability, divide to give rise to two stem cells, um, or with the opposite probability, give rise to, to two differentiated cells. And the two processes kind of balance um, each other out. And so the thinking is that this is the more um, prevalent mechanism um, that 
exist. So you can formulate these things in a very simple mathematical models with ODEs, and we're certainly not the first one to propose these models, but that's general structure. You can put stem cells, transit amplifying cells, or various stages of transit amplifying cells and finally differentiated cells, or you can just condense it down to saying stem cells is anything that divides, and then the, what doesn't divide is we call a differentiated cell and have a, have a simpler, simpler model. So if you have a model um, like this, I mean, this, the, the ODEs that you see there is basically a representation of the schematic diagram down there. Um, you, you get very simple dynamics. It all depends on the probability of self-renewal P, which is one of the parameters of the model. If P is bigger than 0.5, then you're more likely to self-renew, make two stem cells rather than two differentiated cells, and you get um, exponential growth. If P is less than 0.5, it's the opposite. You're more likely to differentiate out, which is essentially like a death process, and go extinct. And if P is 0.5, exactly 0.5, then you have a constant population of equilibrium. It's obviously not a realistic model because what, what parameter is ever exactly 0.5 um, in, in, in nature? Not, not happening. So it's been proposed that various lineage feedbacks are happening. These lineage feedbacks are crucial for um, homeostatic control. And uh, there are basically two feedbacks that have been experimentally documented. Um, one is on the probability of self-renewal, and one is on the rate of cell division. That's been done in the context of the olf olfactory uh, epithelium. And so if you, so, so there, there are these data that show that, that these feedbacks seem to be happening in that system. And if you put that into the mathematical model, then you get a more reasonable behavior of, of, of the system. Now you have an equilibrium as, as long as the probability to self-renew is um, bigger than 0.5, then you go to stable equilibrium, okay? And, and, and so that's more reasonable. And, and so these feedbacks are described by these expressions, R prime and, and P prime, um, where they depend on, on, on the number of differentiated cells which secrete those, those feedback factors. So that results in, in, in better dynamics, just to give it some more um, biological um, underpinning. Um, GDF11 and active in beta have been uh, identified in, 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 in with respect to what, what, what these feedback factors are that mediate um, these processes. So we have a good biological underpinning for this. So we started working on this uh, as well. We started working it from an evolutionary point of view and asked um, what, if you start off with a healthy population, you can introduce various mutants, a stem cell can stop responding to the feedback factors or a differentiate cell can stop producing the feedback factors and you can do it for different, for the different kinds of feedbacks and then see which mutants can invade and what kind of growth patterns you get. So that's, that's, um, where, 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 where we started, not gonna go much in detail in that. Among these two feedback processes in this, in this model, it turns out that only this one, the feedback on self-renewal is really re relevant for homeostasis, okay? Um, if you have feedback on P, on, on the self-renewal rate of stem cells, then you get that equilibrium, the stable equilibrium and the behavior that we desire. The feedback on R that we had in there doesn't, if, if that's the only feedback, that doesn't maintain homeostasis. So if we're interested in homeostasis, we're gonna just focus on, 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 on that negative feedback right now. And so what we wanted to know now is what if you, so, so this is a, a, an important statement that this feedback can, it's, it's an exper experimentally documented um, scenario. It, it models say it can result in homeostatic control. So we wanted to know if you take exactly that scenario and put it in a spatially structured population in the simplest setting, what do we observe? Do we confirm the same results or do we observe differences? And so we made a, a spatially explicit agent-based model. And this is not aimed to be biologically realistic. It is just aimed to translate these ODEs that I just showed you, having these processes and the feedback in a spatially restricted system where cells can only divide to their nearest neighbors and feedback factors are produced by cells and they mostly affect the neighborhood and they diffuse out um, uh, with, with the given diffusion rate. So the agent-based model has two parts to it. Um, the first part is just, just to the agent-based model on the, on the bottom there, you have the cells, they occupy a, a, a grid. Um, they can be stem cells, they can be differentiated cells, they have probability to, to divide and probability to die. The feedback factors influence the probability to self-renew, just like in the ODE, say, same assumption. Then we have a, so if you can think of it as a grid on top of it, and each cell has a patch into which essentially the feedback factors are secreted, and this is then run by ODEs in each individual patch and the, and the, the, the feedback factors diffuse um, outwards at a, at a given rate. So it's exactly the same model as the ODE that I showed you, but it is formulated in a spatial, in a spatial setting. So it's a hybrid agent-based 
kind of model. So what do we observe in this model? What we observe in contrast to the ODE is that in this model, um, this feedback on the self-renewal probability cannot really maintain homeostasis by itself. So here we have the grid now, and, and the grid size we can call the carrying capacity, and we can vary that grid size, we can vary the size of the system. And what you observe here, which is shown in this graph there, is if you, if you increase the size of the system, you increase the number of stem cells and you increase the number of differentiated cells. So the feedback by itself does not hold the cell population at a constant level at homeostasis. What, what holds them back is the availability of space. And if you've got an infinite amount of space, you'll have an infinite amount of cells. And so we can conclude from this that in, in, in this spatial system, it's more complicated. There's some, some other stuff going on. The, this feedback that was shown to lineage feedback that was shown experimentally um, to work in the olfactory epithelium, if you do that in the spatially explicit system, it cannot um, account for homeostatic control. So what are the model properties? I mean, this is kind of quite theoretical because um, there are obviously components missing, such as extracellular matrix, which are, we are starting to put in um, as well. But for now, the, what, what sort of dynamics just do you observe? You, 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 you don't observe that feedback can keep the population constant, but we do observe that feedback can reduce the density of the cell population, and it does so by forming spatial structures and clumps throughout the system. The blue are the stem cells, the yellow are the differentiated cells, and that's kind of what you just get in just out of, out of this system. Um, if you reduce the amount of feedback that you have, um, you see very different dynamics in the sense that the stem cells then take over the entire system. There are no more spatial structures, no empty space or dark blue up there is empty space. Essentially, everything gets taken over, and maybe this is something that corresponds to where you go towards um, carcinogenesis. You can also see that in this case, with the weak feedback, that you the stem cells are in the majority, whereas with strong feedback, the stem cells are in the minority, which is how it should be um, in a tissue. So maybe this has um, something to do that is still important for cancer development, going from a low density scenario to a, with few stem cells to a scenario where the stem cells start in, in, invading. Um, this is also quite theoretical. It's, it's interesting. You can vary the strength of feedback inhibition, and, and you can see whether these clumps the spatial structures are observed or not. There's a rather sharp transition as with, with low feedback. You don't have the spatial structure, then you, you increase the feedback strengths. All of a sudden, the behavior of the system jumps and it goes into these into this spatial structures. This is a variance of mean is a, is a measure of, of the clumpiness of, of, of the distribution um, of the cell. So I, I mean, I don't think that has much biological meaning, but I find it interesting because it's a property of the model. And, and, and as we build around this and make it more realistic, it's important to keep that um, in mind. Oh, this is just um, to, to, to finish that, that up, looking at parameter dependencies. So when do you observe this clumped, this clumped spatial patterns? Or, and when do you observe persistence uniform uh, the uniform distribution. So the persistence is in red, the uniform distribution is in, is in blue. So um, feedback has to be sufficiently strong to, to observe the clump distribution. And it depends on, on the diffusion rates. Um, the, the faster the feedbacks diffuse, the more you have these this sort of um, clumped structures. For whatever that worth, just, just showing for completeness the parameter dependence. So, so conclusions um, um, from this part is um, negative feedback on the stem cell self-renewal rate alone um, cannot maintain homeostasis in a spatial system. In the ODE, it does. In the spatial system, it breaks down. Um, it, it does not. Um, and that's an important insight. Again, the model is very simple. The ODE model was quite simple to start with. Translating that into space is equally simple, but it shows that the ODE conclusions break down. And, and now we're working to um, put in other aspects of the microenvironment, stroma, and, and so on, and, and, and see how that we can make that part more realistic. So, okay, um, homeostasis, still an open question. What, what actually maintains homeostasis? You probably need to put more complex things in there. But let's continue thinking about the lineage feedback business. For, so what happens during tumor growth? Let's um, um, not think about a stable homeostatic population anymore, but let's think about a transformed cell population, a tumor um, that grows. And the idea here is that, well, in healthy tissue, you have stem cells, transit amplifying cells, differentiated cells. In a tumor, you obviously also have, have that. People talk about cancer stem cells, more differentiated cells. 
So if this, this architecture carries over, then um, regulatory control feedback mechanism might also carry over. So whatever lineage control mechanisms are present in the tissue may, carry, may, may still remain to a certain extent in, in the tumor. And so quite some time ago, Ignacio did some quite comprehensive work where he, he looked at various tumor growth pattern. What are, what are the laws according to which different tumors grow? And if you can find all sorts of things, you can find non-spatial growth patterns, basically exponential. Um, you can find lower than exponential. You find a whole load of different patterns. And the interesting thing that he found was that you can account for all of these different tumor growth patterns um, that you find in the literature by just varying your assumptions and strength of feedback that remain in, in the tumor. So the stronger the feedback, the more the, um, the growth curve is going to curve down and, 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 and be slower than, than, than you'd expect otherwise. The interesting thing is really that you can, but just by varying a couple of parameters, you can, you can account for all these different um, growth patterns. Um, again, that could be coincidence, I don't know, but it, it, it also tells us that maybe, maybe this indicates that these lineage control mechanisms that are present in tissues and have been documented, they carry over in the tumor and, and, and they remain there. So we then started, started talking to Keith Chan. He gave a talk at UCI at some point and he was showing some interesting data on, 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 on stem cells in, in bladder cancer. And he said that he actually um, uh, found some evidence of feedback control in his system when he treats um, bladder cancer mouse xenograft. So we started working together um, to, to explore this. So the types of experiments that he does is he take, uses a PDX model, takes a tumor out of a patient, puts it on the back of the mouse, grows it, and then he applies clinically um, relevant chemotherapy regimes. These are just pulses of chem chemotherapy, certain periods of time you give chemotherapy, then you go off treatment, you repeat it, you have like four or five um, cycles. And basically what he observed in these mice is that initially you got a okay response to chemotherapy, but the more treatment cycles they used, the less pronounced the response to treatment. You can see at the end of this curve, when you start treatment, there's almost no response anymore. So what do you think is the reason for this? First thought is drug resistance. They could not find drug resistant mutants. So the thought was then that it has something to do with stem cells because stem cells um, arise, uh, stem cells um, are resistant to treatments to a certain degree, they're less susceptible to, to the destructive effect of, of chemotherapy. And so maybe if the stem cells enrich over time, this could be a, a, a mechanism. So there's quite a bit of heterogeneity going on. So depending on what tumor you look at, um, you, can, you can get cases where there's quite good response and the response is sustained quite well. So on, on the right hand side, you have much better responses, for instance, than, than uh, on the left-hand side, where the responses are, are, are reduced significantly as treatments are um, applied. And so part of what we wanted to do is try to explain what determines this heterogeneity. So we started off with um, Keith's work, and Keith thought that this is what's going on. You have got stem cells that can be quiescent, so it can be cycling. Stem cells will eventually give rise to differentiated cells. Now, you apply chemotherapy, this is gonna kill your differentiated cells, okay? And what he found was when chemotherapy kills the differentiated cells, they secrete a feedback factor, a wound healing signal mediated by PGE2. And this wound healing signal essentially drives quiescent cells into proliferation and then increases the rate of stem cell proliferation. So he he's calls this stem cell repopulation. So if you've got chemotherapy, um, you reduce the differentiated cell population, um, this then reacts by triggering a wound healing response that makes more stem cells to compensate for, for that. So that, that's actually a, a nice um, control loop that they demonstrated in, in, in the tumor in response to treatment. And there's some good data out there that shows that this repopulation might be responsible for the resistance that you observe. Um, you can see that if you use chemotherapy alone, that's the black line, not on the bottom, the, 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 the black circles there, then you can block this wound healing response that results in stem cell repopulation, and you give the chemotherapy, then you get a much better treatment response. So Keith said that this is a really important mechanism um, that drives um, the loss of control, the stem cell repopulation. If you inhibit it, um, then you can get a better treatment response. So we wanted to um, test this hypothesis with, with mathematical um, 
models which we set out to do. So we formulated his kind of system in terms of mathematical models, acquiescent stem cells, stem cells, transit amplifying cells, differentiated cells, um, based on what we did previously. Um, whoops. So, and then we simulated essentially um, what's going on when the differentiated cells secrete these factors that result in stem cell repopulation. And these are the simulations, the gray lines are, are the treatment um, phases. And let's make, concentrate on the right graph over there. You can see that the dashed lines are the differentiated, more differentiated cells. The black line is the um, stem cells. So every time you treat, the differentiated cell go down and all, more or less all what is kept is stem cell because they're affected less by treatment. But then when you stop treatment and the tumor starts to regrow, it re-equilibrates to exactly the same percentage of stem cells that you had pre-treatment. And you do that after every treatment cycle. And so if the percentage of stem cells after each treatment cycle re-equilibrates to where it was before, then um, you don't really lose response to treatment because the proportion of stem cells is still, still the same. And that's in the red and green um, lines, um, uh, bars on, on the bottom. You see that as treatment cycles proceed, the treatment response is not lost. And that happens both when you have the wound healing response plus chemotherapy or if you have chemotherapy without wound healing. So, so based on these simulations, we sort of rejected his initial idea that, that said that this wound healing response alone is responsible for stem cell enrichment and for um, the resulting um, non-responsiveness um, to treatment. That's actually a great um, use of, of, of a model, much better than if it confirms the data. If it goes against the data, we, if we formulate assumptions in terms of the model and, and these assumptions don't give us what we expect or what we think is going on, then we can say that there is more to the, to the story. And so I think the reason why this is, why we observe this effect is that if you have this model in the absence of any treatment, you see um, straight growth and stem cells don't enrich during growth. And so every time you stop treatment, everything grows and without any enrichment processes of stem cells happening and everything equilibrates to where it was before. So then we started to hypothesize, what if you put these negative feedbacks in? And let, let, let's say we're not worried about homeostasis, so we put negative feedback on the rate of cell division, um, which just modifies the growth kinetics, but it doesn't prevent growth. So let's assume that differentiated cells um, produce some factors that inhibit the division rate of stem cells and, and also transit amplifying cells. In this case, you get different growth kinetics. During growth, stem cells actually enrich. Um, the longer it goes, the more stem cells you have. Okay, and so that's, that's interesting. And so if you then apply that to the original setting that we had, we treat, um, you can see, let's go to the graph on the, on the right where we plot the, the stem cells in black and the differentiated cells in, in, in the dashed line. So every time you treat, again, the differentiated cells plummet and you've got only stem cells left. But as you stop treatment, it doesn't re-equilibrate. The fraction of stem cells does not re-equilibrate re to where it was before. Now the enrichment that was um, obtained during treatment is maintained to a certain extent. And this enrichment is, is increased and increased with each treatment cycle. And so on the bottom left graph, you see that the, the percent of the reduction of the tumor goes down with each treatment cycle, just as you observe in Keith's experiments. And it, it happens both with and without the wound healing response, but the wound healing response, um, if you include that, which is the red line, it, it, it makes this a stronger effect. So the wound healing response is important, whatever he, whatever, what he saw in his experiment is indeed very important, but you need an additional component to actually see the reduction in, in the treatment response. And, and we, we think it, it is because there are feedback processes happening in there. Um, and when these feedback, negative feedback loops and control loops are there, then the properties of the tumor growth changes such that enrichment occurs as the tumor grows. And this then results in subsequent additional enrichment with each treatment cycle. We did the same thing in space because we never know, maybe everything breaks down if you formulate that in space. Um, our bottom line is it, 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 it remains as a 3D agent-based model with stem cells and transit amplifying and differentiated cells. So I'm not gonna go much into detail there. So can we find any evidence that any of this is, is, is real and, and then any of this makes sense? So the hypothesis is that this loss of treatment response happens because you've got feedback in there. So how do we know whether there may be feedback in these tumors or not? So heterogeneity, I told you, we had different tumors. Some of them respond better than others. So we hypothesize that those that respond better are the ones without feedback or with less feedback. Those respond worse are the ones with have more, have more feedback. So if you look at the left-hand graph, it's a theoretical um, graph that shows you in the absence of any treatment, how does a tumor grow if it has no feedback? 
Um, this is a, uh, not a spatial model. Um, then you get exponential growth with negative feedback. You get sub-exponential growth or slowed inhibited kind of um, growth. There's a different in growth, difference in, in, in growth patterns. So in principle, you can say, you can estimate whether there's feedback or not just looking at the, by just looking at the growth patterns in the absence of treatment. So if you look at the sensitive populations, uh, sensitive tumors that, that were treated in the mice, um, on the right-hand graph, you see that those grow almost exponentially, which when we can say that, that there is not much feedback in there, and that's why they are sensitive. On the other hand, those that, that show a degree of resistance and, and loss of treatment response, they show a sub-exponential growth curve, which could indicate that there's feedback in there. And based on these data, data you can estimate the feedback, which we've just done for fun. I'm not sure how um, important it is. But it, it does give us some solid data to, to indicate that there are differences in, in, in control mechanisms between the tumor and that this can um, give rise to differences in the sensitivity to treatment and which should be um, investigated in, in more detail. Okay, and, and I want to finish up with that. Basically, we then expanded on, on this rather than having just we just have this one feedback loop from differentiated cells on, onto, onto the rate of cell division. Then we ask more generally, there are all sorts of different feedback controls that could be theoretically happening in the tumor, and we define mathematically which one would give rise to similar results. And that's in that paper. I'm not going to go into detail in that. And then just to take our message um, to conclude that aspects of tissue architecture and, and feedback loops can be very important in determining the growth properties and the treatment response that can be um, Treatment resistant based on stem cell enrichment. Stem cell enrichment can be determined in part by what control loops are present in the tumor. And you now need to, we again, including tumor stroma interactions, which can involve additional signaling, which um, can lead to more stem cell enrichment or less stem cell enrichment. Andre had a paper recently that argued um, in favor of that. And so we're looking into that in this system as well. And then just to finish up, these are all the people I've already acknowledged the most important people that were in there, summarizes here some more people and also acknowledging um, grants from NSF and NIH. And before I, I stop talking, I, I want to say that we're about to expand in the group and we're going to be hiring postdocs um, pretty soon, hopefully not too long from now. And so if you're interested and, and, and you would like to explore these sort of things and please get in touch. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Hey, so yeah, cool stuff. Um, so in the uh, spatial model with the stem cells and um, differentiated cells, you were saying that there wasn't a, or that that if you increase the size of, of the domain, then um, the the sort of the model would sort of grow uh, sort of proportional to that. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what I'm wondering is if you sort of drew a window, right, that was consistently sized in all of those different um, model cases and only looked within that window, mm. would the dynamics be effectively the same? Or, or did you see differences as you increase the, the size of the spatial domain and like the patterns that would form? So if you, if you have the spatial size constant, then if you increase your feedback, you get a reduction in density. So you do see differences, yes. So if you've got strong feedback, you have low density, you get these clumps, remember you showed you this, whatever that means, and you have stem cells in a minority, differentiated cells in a minority, in the majority. If you reduce feedback, this breaks down and stem cells kind of invade the whole space and the whole grid gets filled up and you get stem cell dominance. So maybe, although it, in the strict sense, it can't lead to homeostasis, it, 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 it keeps the system healthy, so, so, so to speak. Yes, so we do observe that. But were those effects sort of invariant to the size of the domain? Yes. Okay, thank you. It just takes longer to simulate. Hey, fascinating talk. If I understood you correctly, you were modeling stem cells as dividing and giving rise to two stem cells, but stem cells are known to divide. To differentiate cells, you mean? No, you had oh. a slide that stem cells divide. Oh, it's yes. Oh. But stem cells divide asymmetrically. They give rise to one stem cell and to one transit amplifying cell. And I'm wondering if you put that dynamic into your model, whether you would have different results as you're looking at the dynamics and between stem cells and non-stem cells. Um, because it seemed that part of what was happening is you were getting a result in which there was stem cell enrichment, mm. but stem cell enrichment doesn't tend to happen because stem cell division only gives rise to one stem cell. So there's a, a comment on, on, on how, what, what the data say. So what does a stem cell do? Certainly in a lot of Drosophila 
experiments, you've got asymmetric cell division, one stem cell give rise to one stem cell and one differentiator. That's the asymmetric cell division business. In mammalian cells, they've done a lot of lineage tracing um, um, experiments, and they're, they're arguing for the probabilistic mechanism where a stem cell either gives rise to two stem cells or to do, to do differentiated cells. Obviously, there's not a debate that's settled, but there are an increasing number of papers that, that argue um, in, in favor of, of that, that. Argue that based on looking at stem cell division and looking at the organization of yes. the daughter cells. I've not seen any of that. I'd be curious to. I can send you the. Yeah, I can send you the, really the, the references for that. That's why we. That's why we adopted that because in, in mammalian cells the, there is this thing. So so if you assume that you have asymmetric cell division, then you don't really need any feedback or anything because the population is well, constant, right? But that's um, nevertheless you have feedback in there, and I don't know how that works with asymmetric cell division. I mean. In, in several cases, in several instances, the dynamics are similar, if you assume one mechanism or, or another, but for homeostasis, there are differences. And, and Well, but except that the stem cells give rise to a transit amplifying cell, and transit amplifying cells divide very rapidly and symmetrically. Right. So in normal tissue development, you don't see changes in stem cell population size, you see changes in non stelp stem cell population sizes. And in the recovery of bone marrow after chemotherapy, you see the same thing. You, you virtually never see expansion in the stem cell pool. Over time, you see depletion of it, but it takes a long time. But you see competent repopulation of the marrow, right? which is consistent with the asymmetric division, not a symmetric division you, model. So I'd, yeah. I'd like to see those Papers. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, for, for for tumors, you definitely see stem cell enrichment happening, and and it's it's conceivable. I, I don't think the data support that. Um, they stem cell frequency in tumors tends to always, if, as long as you're not talking about liquid tumors, tends to always be about three to five percent. Well, for for example, in these data that I just showed you in the bladder cancer xenografts, they they do expand. Xenograft. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's also breast. There's also. There's but, also data from breast cancer from human patients. But those are xenografts. Those are purified cells. They're, they're also data, yeah, they're also data from human patients that right. show after successive okay, chemotherapy regime. Yeah, yeah, we can talk later. I mean, there's there's a bunch of data we base this on. Yeah. Hi. A um, couple of questions regarding your the aspirin experiments. How how do the um, how do the levels in vitro compare to the the levels you achieve in patients? Yeah, so we 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 um, adjusted the dose in the experiments that they kind of mimic the concentration okay. in the patients. And these are different doses in vitro and so, different doses in the xenografts. So it's comparable. It's comparable, that's okay. what we were aiming for. So they're, they're different doses that take depending on how many pills they take and that sure, we sure. kind of check. Yeah. And the other question I had is um, the aspirin effects. Are they specific for colorectal cancer or do you see similar results in in other kind of tumor cells we haven't investigated other tumor cells but, but the data show that a variety of cancers there is protection yes so you think it's generalized to to other cancer cells yeah i, I don't i we would have to look at it but there's a possibility okay thank you yeah i think the data suggests in the gi tract particularly the aspirin is good can protective yeah. so i'm interested in the the prediction about the adenomas under aspirin having more mutations i get the model prediction. Um, and the reason it's striking to me is that when we looked at Barrett's esophagus and did a phylogenetic analysis of the rate of mutation in, in patients that had changed their NSAID use, their aspirin use, we saw that the rate of copy number alterations go down when they went on NSAIDs. So right. um, and there's some flaws in that methodology that I think we use. So I'm, I'm not totally confident in that. But have you guys looked at the mutational burden in the adenos that develop under patients that are taking aspirin? No, no, we have not looked. This is a purely theoretical thing. And also remember that in that argument, we're, we're comparing a tumor that grows in the absence of aspirin to size N yes. and in the presence of aspirin to right. the same size N. And usually if, 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 if you aspirin, you have a lower size, right? Right, so but you, yeah, a, right. So you, do, you want to normalize by the size of the adenoma. Yeah, um, and, and, but, and so maybe that's where in, in, in the data that you're referring to, because they're probably not the same size, right? Well, so in various esophagus, it's just on the surface. There's no, right. ad, there's no adenomas, yeah. right? Yeah. But, um, but we, we thought it had to do with inflammation, that maybe with the inflammation may be mutagenic with right. reactive oxygen species. And, yeah, and all, stuff, all of that comes stuff in. Stuff that you won't see in like an immune incompetent, yeah. uh, immune 
compromised mouse. Absolutely, um, and we don't have this in the model, so right. it's entirely possible that if you put that in, that that conclusion changes. It seems like the it seems like the tissues or the data might be out there in terms of adenos in humans that had been on aspirin versus off. Yeah, it should look. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.